Well, now everybody can see our wonderful panelists. Um, I will go ahead and introduce them. Uh, everybody, when, it, when you are asking questions of them, please type them into the Q&A. Uh, you should see the Q, unless you have a problem like I had at the intro, you should see a Q&A button at the bottom. Um, so uh, my rescuer here is Tara Haley. She's a <laughs> freelance science and health journalist whose work has appeared in outlets including National Geographic, The New York Times, NPR, Scientific American, Medscape, and elsewhere. She's a regular featured contributor at Medium, and she's the medical studies topic leader for the Association of Healthcare Journalists. She's also the author of Vaccination Investigation, The Informed Parent, and various children's science books. Bruce Y. Lee is a senior contributor at Forbes, a professor of health policy and management at CUNY, executive director of a center that develops AI and other computer-aided approaches for health and healthcare, and an entrepreneur. He's also our Duxwa social media chair. He's written for a range of other publications and platforms as well, such as the New York Times, Time, and The Guardian. Additionally, he and his work have regularly been quoted and appeared in a variety of other media outlets. Over the years, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, he's often covered breaking news with a very quick turnaround, sometimes only a few hours. Stephanie Desmond is the Director of Public Relations and Marketing for the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs within the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's also a co-host of the popular podcast, Public Health on Call. In addition to her current work at Hopkins, she has a total of 15 years experience as a reporter in Maryland, Florida, and Alabama. So she can tell us about writing on a deadline from both the journalism and the PIO perspectives. So to open it up, uh, why don't you each tell me which tasks have been your biggest time sinks and what you really had to work on to learn to do more efficiently? And anyone can go ahead and jump in to answer. I'll start. <laughs> um, so I, I, I kind of had a couple of things here. Four, they fall into four categories. Twitter, email, <laughs> and those are kind of constants. Um, over-researching and over-reporting, you know, when I, when I can't catch myself. And finding the right source. I take finding sources very seriously. Like if I'm writing about lung cancer, I don't just go looking for a lung cancer source. I look, go looking for a lung cancer researcher, researcher who has specialized in the drug that works on, you know, like I, I get, I want to make sure I have the, like, if I'm writing about vaccines, I don't just contact a vaccine researcher. I look for the pertussis vaccine researcher who specifically looked at waning in the last 10 years. So um, sometimes finding the right source can take a longer time. I will say that PIOs are a huge help in narrowing that down. And I also keep a massive Google, um, spreadsheet of my with where I, where I keep keywords so that helps I've done better about um Twitter in more recent year or well more recent months I should say in the past year I've gotten better about catching myself on that um sometimes I'll actually set a timer on my phone of like you know okay I'm going to spend 20 minutes on Twitter and when it goes off I can sort of reassess it sort of pulls me out of you know whatever argument I've allowed myself to get pulled into um, and I've also sort of, I don't really scroll much on Twitter anymore. I usually go where someone tells me to go. Like someone points out a tweet I should check out kind of thing um, or check a specific person. So those are ways that I, I address that. But those are the things that, that are often the most challenging. Great. Um, Stephanie or Bruce, you want to give your answers to that? Sure. Um, I, I would say that the that takes up the most time can be something that reporters do all the time, which is uh, use a recorder. So if we, I personally don't use a recording device and I never have. And uh, this is for stories, for press releases, for, for news. I have not used a, a recording device because going back through the notes on the recording is much harder to do than to just look at your notes and pull out um, the most important things, because you'll remember the most important things, they'll just jump out at you. And, and uh, so that's been my, uh, that was that's sort of always my philosophy. I will say that um, I just, I just started writing a book. And I just discovered something I call, I'm sure you all have heard of it, Otter AI. And so because I'm writing a book, and I need those transcripts, I, um, and Otter is the most amazing thing you'll ever 
ever have. And so it, it uh, transcribes your notes, your recordings, um, like magic, like 20 minutes for an hour long conversation. And then you've got a transcript of everything you did. And if you need to hear what, what it said, what they said, and you just click on the line and it speaks to you, you hear the, the audio recording. And so I imagine that if I was doing this all over again, I might change my tune and use Otter as uh, instead of just taking notes. Thank you. Awesome. Bruce, uh, anything that you've really had to work on? Yeah, I think there's two, two things in general, which can be very uh, big time sinks. So one is going the wrong direction with an article. Um, so what I'd like to do at the very beginning is think about, you know, where does this article fall in terms of the spectrum of things? So on one hand, it could be something that where the knowledge is pretty clear and established, the science is very established, and your, your purpose is really just to get it out there, like let people explain things to people. On the other hand, the other end of the spectrum is something that's extremely controversial or people don't really know much about. Um, if you go like with the latter, if you go down like one direction and then you suddenly realize, wait, hold on a second, there are actually multiple points of view or this is controversial, you might have to back up and that affects everything, right? Because that affects the, 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 the experts that you contact, the people that you talk to, because if you're completely excluding, you know, one whole segment or one whole field, then you have to back up and then restart everything again. So I think it's important at the very beginning to first classify what kind of article that you're writing and what's really actually known about this. And then, then you can actually have a strategy that where you're not really wasting time. And I think a second one is um, worrying too much about the pros. Uh, so, you know, many times you can sit there and, and, and for hours perseverate over the lead or perseverate over like how you're actually gonna phrase something. So it's better to just kind of vomit things on paper. Um, uh, that may sound a little too graphic, but it's basically, you're just taking things, just throwing there, like throwing ideas out there. Sometimes I tell people, you know, just record yourself because sometimes it's easier to just speak something out and you record yourself or, or like Stephanie mentioned, you know, Otter AI or something of that sort. So it's actually on paper and you, then you can look at it and see what it looks like. And then you can proceed to saying, okay, I need to fill these gaps with, um, you know, these experts or, or these sources, et cetera. Thanks, Bruce. So you were talking about those early stages when you're conceiving what's going to go into an article. Um, and you started to tell us, you know, the kind of information you have to gather, what you have to think about it. Um, that was going to be my next question. When you're first developing that idea for the story, um, how do you kind of plot out your course and the time you're going to need to allocate? I, I myself like to be able to visualize at least what the article is going to look like. Uh, you know, not necessarily the content naturally, because you might find out different things after you do some more research. Um, but but visualize like what what is the story going to be like from start to finish? And as much as you can do that, the uh, you you're more likely to be able to you know plot it out. Like if it's still if it's still fuzzy and you're not really sure. Um, the challenge is it, it can go too many different directions. So sometimes it takes time to just sit down and say, okay, well, you know, once again, what's the strategy? What kind of article is this? Um, and, and doing a little bit of, you know, putting the brakes on for a short bit can actually save you a lot of time. Okay, we've got Tara back. Uh, yeah, Tara? No, no. I'm in my husband's office and I was moving because it's hard to find the, yeah, the, the family has taken over the rest of the house and I'm in his office, which is not the cleanest. And I was trying to make it so that I wasn't moving the camera all over. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Well, maybe you can tell us um, what steps you go through in those early phases to yeah. make sure you can go through in an organized so the, way. The first consideration is how familiar am I with the topic already? So if you're giving me a, a story to write about vaccines, I have a huge foundational base on that already. So I might be able to write that story three or four times faster than a story about a topic that I've never written about or I've only written one or two articles on. So the familiarity is kind of the first consideration. And I consider that even when I accept the assignment. Um, how many people will I have to interview and how involved are those interviews? So that refers to the length of the interview, the complexity of the questions, going through the notes and picking the quotes that I'm gonna use. Um, I'm working on a story right now about PCOS and it's about the state of the science on PCOS. 
and it's a long, it, the story itself is only going to be about 1500 words, but it's requiring, you know, multiple one hour interviews about really in-depth stuff that I don't know the details of in terms of endocrinology, because it's just such an involved area. Um, mm -hmm. And then how much external research will I need to do? So after I did two of those uh, interviews for PCOS, I then went and pulled up about 15 research reviews on, you know, the etiology of PCOS, and I'm going to have to go through those. So I have to think about those different things. And when I was offered that assignment, the, um, the, the editor who asked me if I was interested in taking it, I said, only if you don't need it for a few weeks, because I, it's going to take me a few weeks to do that. So those are the things that I think about. Um, I, I don't really allocate time and that's probably a factor of my own neurodiversity. I have ADHD and that means that I do a lot of things that my colleagues do very differently. And I don't do things that my colleagues do do. <laughs> so, uh, my brain doesn't operate the way kind of like normal people's brains does. So, um, I don't really think about time budgeting in that way because there's no value to it for me because I won't stick to it. So, <laughs> It's a useful thing to know about yourself. And, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are dealing with the same thing. It's useful to know that what works for one person might not work for another person. Stephanie, I know that, um, you know, you've had um, experience churning things out on a really, really short timetable. Um, do you have, uh, what's your perspective on how to think about how you're going to budget your time from step one? Well, the first thing is, and I think, Bruce alluded to this already, that perfect is the enemy of the good, right? So you want, you know, of course, all the facts need to be straight. That's, you know, the highest priority, but you are not going to sit there and write a novel. You know, this is not supposed to be the most perfect thing. Sometimes you come up with a great lead, sometimes you don't, and you just keep writing because you have, you know, you can't let it go on forever. Uh, I'm not, that was, frankly, my training as a daily journalist really served me so well because you only have um, a short, a lot of time, right? So I have from 10 to six today. That's all I have. You know, it's due, it's right. It's, it's out the door at six o'clock. So you, you know, you make sort of a wish list in your mind of all the things you'd like to cover. And then you get down to brass tacks and you realize exactly what I'm going to be able to accomplish in this small amount of time. Got it. Yeah. So um, everyone, please start sending your questions to the, the Q&A. Just type them in and um, I can ask them as they come in. Um, so Stephanie, um, I know you've, so you, you've been on both sides of this, writing press releases and news articles. Are there any strategies or approaches that you think are really specific to one or the other, or do they both apply to everything? So, I mean, every you think I think of a press release as a one source story. So you sort of so you're starting with the same basis. Um, again, I don't it doesn't have to be the most beautiful thing ever read because the whole idea is to get somebody to be interested in it and write their own story. Right. So you want them you want to pique their interest enough that they'll call you and want to speak to your expert. So I would also say that um, so my press releases are basically med medical med medical science, behavior science uh, type of work. And what I have found with those is that you can be completely overwhelmed if you're not careful. So to decide if something is worthy of being written about, this is even from the perspective, this is why I use this actually when I was a reporter as well as as a, as a public information officer. I mean, you have to, um, you read like, you read, you don't read it all the way through, right? You start at the top, you read the abstract, you read the introduction, um, you skim back down to the bottom for the discussion and the conclusion. That's how I start. This tells me, is this worth writing about? Uh, and then once I decide that, once I decide that, I also then will, then I'll go to the source and ask them the questions I need to ask. I don't need to read the method section, which is going to tell me a hundred different things. I can say, so what, how did you do this? And it'll take them three minutes to tell me, and they'll mostly do it in English. I will say that one thing that's always been important to me uh, is I, I see myself as a translator. So um, I am able to translate this, uh, the science, the muckety-muck, all the language that people are using that, um, that most people don't uh, understand. And I am able to sort of get them to explain it to me 
in simple enough terms that I can get other people to understand because I have no, interestingly, I have no background in science and I've been doing science for a very long time. Uh, and basically it's because I just ask the questions. And if someone's talking way over my head, I say, I, yeah, let's try that again. You know, what would you tell, what would you tell your 10 year old? What would you tell your grandmother? I mean, those kinds of things. Because even, um, cause when I worked at Johns Hopkins Medicine, we had several PhDs on the public, um, on the media staff. And they had a lot of more trouble than I did with these complicated uh, releases because they were being spoken to like a PhD. And what is the chance that your PhD is in the same as, you know, is in the same subject as the other, as the person you're talking, you're interviewing. So even two PhDs don't have a lot, a ton of common ground. And so the idea is, so I was always able to say, oh, you know, I last took science in the 12th grade. So help me out here. And I'm never afraid to ask a stupid question. I think that's the key to everything. Excellent. Thanks. So um, we've got a question coming in. How do you organize juggling multiple projects that are at different stages of researching, reporting, interviewing, writing, and editing? Um, imagine you all have experience with that. I create a daily checklist for uh, this is uh, this really it speaks to me because of my, the ADHD I refer to. Um, I have a, I create a daily checklist for the next day each evening, so I know so I don't have to think in the morning what I'm going to have to do. I get up and I know what I'm going to have to do. Um, and when I'm doing that, I kind of go through each, uh, I use Scrivener. And so I look at, I have one, I'll always have a to-do list that has a list of the stories that I'm working on. And so I look at each of those stories and then I go into Scrivener and say, okay, where am I on that story? And what do I have to do next on that story? And that's how I, you know, so it's step one, look at the list of stories. Step two, look at each story in Scrivener for where it's at. Step three, pick the next steps that I need to do. And in terms of the urgency of them, I might not do anything on two stories and I might do three things on another story. I might spend the whole day on one story and put all the other stories off. Um, but I make that on a day-to-day -day basis. I know that a lot of people make that in advance, like they, they, they'll make it, you know, several weeks in advance and they'll plan it out. I have tried that. And for anybody out there who's watching this, who has heard other people do that and been an envious and thought, why can't I do that? It's okay. You can still be successful if you can't do that because I can't do that and I am still successful and I can still manage my time. I just can't do it on three and four week sort of planning ahead thing. So I, I like to let people know it's okay if you can't do that. There's still ways to do it. And I, I literally make it on a day by day basis. That doesn't mean I never make mistakes. I mean, there's times I forget that I even have a story and I, I find out the hard way when my editor checks in, like, how's that story going? And I'm like, oh yeah, that, that story, that, that story is going great. I say, as I shoot off 15 interview requests, <laughs> um, <laughs> let me give you a, an update in six hours. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I don't actually have sort of a longitudinal way of, of planning that out, so. Are other people's approaches more longitudinal or do they look something like Tara's? I and who's are, so that's why I said that. I don't, know what, right. I don't know what others do, but I've had people tell me what they do and I just look at them in envy like, wow, I wish that my brain did that. <laughs> I'm trying to make my brain do that right now because I've just <laughs> taken on this. I've taken on this book. I've only done, um, you know, I've done some magazine pieces and I've done daily journalism and I do press releases, but I've never done a book before. And I never liked, I never liked to do an outline, right? And with a book, you have to have an outline. Um, you have to know what you're trying to say and roughly in what chapter you're going to say it. Uh, so that's al already been a, sort of a steep learning curve for someone who's very good at doing things right now and very good at getting everything done ahead of deadline, frankly. But to have all of a sudden have this new, this new, um, a whole new way of thinking, which is, is writing a book. I'm writing a book with a professor. And so uh, we have these weekly interviews and that's going really well. But I, I'm starting to realize that I don't, I can't visualize some of the chapters. And so I'm going to have to figure out a way to visualize those chapters because otherwise they're never going to get done. So um, I think that that's, uh, I think it depends on, so I think it depends on the type of project that you're doing. Um, I've never liked outlining though, and I've never liked, I used to work in a paper many, many years ago where they made you do, which is misunderstandable. They, they asked you to tell them what you were doing for the next week. And then my, that was okay, sort of. And then they asked you what you were doing 
the next month. And I thought, I have no idea what I'm going to do for the next month. I'm going to come here every day and, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to write for you guys, but I just wasn't <laughs> able to think that way. That reminds me when I used to teach high school before I was in full-time journalism, it was the same thing where they wanted lesson plans a month in advance. I just made them up. It wasn't what I was going to do, but I just made it up because I couldn't operate that way. <laughs> I'm loving the honesty here. Um, I think it's probably resonating with a lot of people's experiences, including mine. <laughs> we have a question from the audience. Uh, how I, do you? I can't even decide. Oh, yeah, sorry, what... Bruce. Yeah, please. I can't even decide what I'm going to do for the next ten minutes. Sometimes. So. <laughs> um, but one thing I want to um, so mention, you know, so of course, people's styles different differ significantly. But I myself. Uh, if I have multiple things to do, I have to view these as separate sprints because I can't be working on three different articles at once. I have to really focus on just one at a time. And like when you're immersed, then that's when like what whenever you're writing, you want to get to that stage where you're just completely immersed in the article and things are moving along really quickly, right? You, um, everyone who's a writer has been in that situation where you're like, so focused on your writing, you look up and then suddenly like the room's dark because like time has passed and you didn't realize time has passed. And that's when you like really um, move quickest. So I think one of the challenges that I've seen with some people is they try to balance like three at a time, but then what happens is it just kind of, you you know, you only kind of partially do each of those and you don't never get into that whole rhythm. Um, so I'll, I'll focus on something and do a sprint and then later and then put it down if I'm, past you know the point that I wanted to be and then move on to something else it's like the mm -hmm. hit version of journalism high intensity <laughs> pretty much yep yeah, yeah. <laughs> right right and I have that, um, I, and there's, I have so much to do that I so many different you know fingers and so many pots I'm sure that's like you Tara that like I can't couldn't possibly put one aside do one at a time yeah it can't be I done that way I do sometimes do that though in like a day-by-day -day basis which is why I said sometimes I'll work on one thing for one day and then I'll, you know, like I might just work on a different story each day, but I, yeah, it's still, and I can, in a way for me, I can't spend too long on one day because I get that whole ADHD thing, that sensation seeking, I will get bored or frustrated or annoyed. I have to have, in fact, for me, part of the superpower angle of ADHD, one of them is story ideas. They never turn off. Another one is that I can bounce around to bunches of different things. If I get bored with one thing, I can go on to the next, I can go on to the next, and my job actually benefits from that. Right, right. Well, um, so I wanna get to this audience question here. Um, how do you translate a very complex scientific concept into something people can easily understand, connect through their experience and imagination? Um, that probably speaks to the, you know, needing to get in the zone, but, facing that challenge, it can be easy to kind of get stuck. Three things, anecdotes, metaphors, and analogies. Those are the three secret weapons that you use in science writing. I mean, everything else is explaining the science, but if you can use metaphors, analogies, and then personal anecdotes along the way to kind of explain those things one at a time, that's what I find to be the most powerful. I have to understand the concept really well to do that. I, one thing I will do is I'll often run an analogy that I come up with by a scientist. I'll be on the phone with them and I'll say, okay, so what you're saying is, and sometimes they cringe. I mean, sometimes I get it really wrong. Sometimes they just are not an abstract thinker who thinks that way. And they're like, well, maybe I guess, but that you can tell they're uncomfortable with it because it's just not sciencey. Other times they give me an even better one that I wouldn't have thought of. And they say, well, actually it's more like this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's fantastic. So. I love when the when the researcher can come up with their own metaphors and analogies because that's that's that stuff's great because these are really smart people and they come up with really clever analogies and metaphors and so if, when you get lucky and you find someone like that you like to stick with them. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. of times they've come up with them in advance because they've had to explain it to their own family or dinner parties or you know their kids ask them what they do so they have these ready because they've come up with it for the people in their lives. And that's, that's always nice. Yeah, to justify their existence, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I always try to imagine who I'm talking to when I'm writing. So for the most part, like, you know, I'm imagine I'm talking to someone that knows nothing about this subject and like what, what I would say. Uh, and I think this is, more, is also like, it depends on what you're writing, right? So if you're writing an academic article, it's one thing. And if you're writing for the general public, it's another thing. If you're writing a grant, it's another thing. 
So I just imagine myself really like, like the person's in front of me and what am I having to say to that person? Um, and then you try to imagine what their questions would be um, and you wanna kind of proactively answer their questions. Mm -hmm. um, so, so part of it is, is trying to anticipate what could go wrong with your article and, and what could land incorrectly and then anticipating that and then, and then write and put and proactively writing it that way. Right. And, you know, Bruce is uh, both a, a researcher, a scientist and a, a science writer. So, um, you know, you, you're in the position of being the one who has to come up with the clever analogies to explain what you do to people. Yeah, and then I explain the analogies to myself and I either reject them or, or accept them. So. <laughs> I was gonna to add to that. Um, one thing I use a lot is crowdsourcing as well. If I can't come up with an analogy, I'll hop on Twitter and say, hey, people, how would you describe X, Y, Z? Um, or I'll go on Facebook and say, hey, I have um, a section of a story I'm working on and I don't know if it makes sense. Who wants to read it for me? And I get some responses and then I open up a, a, you know, a personal message with a group and I copy and paste. And I'm like, does this make sense? What's confusing you? So I'm, I'm kind of a queen of social, um crowdsourcing in that regard as well because then i can get direct feedback right then um of you know is this actually working does it make sense or am i missing some aspect here that, that is not you know or is there some disconnect here that i'm not explaining well that's another right. great reason to follow tara she, she'll get up <laughs> questions so it's it's fun because you can answer her questions and also you can see everyone else's answers so yep so we've got another audience question this is uh Basically the same thing that I was going to ask anyway, if no one else got around to asking it. Uh, so the question is about over-reporting, over-researching and sourcing for pitches. Um, how best should you budget your time and energy at the front end? And is it possible to, uh, to quantify the time that you should be putting into a pitch? Um, I think, again, I, I'm not great at doing the whole time budgeting thing and, and sort of like actual you know, numbers but it's more of a nebulous kind of, okay, I am getting paid X amount for this story. And I've worked with this editor X amount of time. And I, I really do think of a story as you get what you pay for. If you're, if you're paying me $500 for a story, you're not going to get what someone paying me $2,000 for a story is going to get because you get what you pay for. And that's what I put into it. Cause I work sort of on an hourly rate in my mind, but to avoid getting caught up in the over-reporting, what I will often do is start out with a list of questions that need to be answered for that study, for, excuse me, for that story. And if I'm going too far afield of those questions, I know I need to reel it in, right? Or if I, if I come across other interesting stuff that, I, that is interesting for later, I save the URLs or the citations in a separate Scrivener note. And then I feel like they're still there if I need to go back to them, but I haven't, so I, I don't have to dive into them now, even if I want to. Um, I'll also, I actually love creating outlines. So I'm, I'm kind of the opposite of um, Stephanie there. Outlines are my friend. And I will often create an outline at the start of working on a story that predicts what I expect it will turn out to be and what I need. And I know it's gonna probably change a lot during the reporting process, but it gives me a guide. And if I'm going again, too far afield, I can stop and say, okay, is this actually an angle I need to pursue because my story is changing? Or is this just, you know, curious Tara going off on a rabbit hole that, that she needs to like, you know, stop for a bit. Um, and I kind of, it, it's more, like I said, it's more of a nebulous kind of, okay, I've spent X, you know, wow, I spent all evening tonight on that story and I'm only getting paid $500 for that story. Okay. I need to wrap this up tonight or, you know, so it's, I, I don't, I, I probably should have some sort of more formal way of doing that. But again, my brain sort of rejects that sometimes. So it's more based on what it feels like <laughs> super sciencey <laughs> um i like to use a sprint method first like you know i'll give myself an hour just to write just like dump everything on a page um and that gives me a sense of what i need to know and what i don't need to know and it it, it i think it just forces you to the sooner you can get things on paper the better because it's easier to um, then mold or adjust what you already have, as opposed to, you know, it's all in your head. And there's a big difference when something's on the page versus in your head. Uh, so, because when, so, it, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Bruce. So at what point in the process are you, are you putting it on the page? Is this before, I, you're not, I guess you're often writing for medium, but you must be pitching stuff to other places too. Is this before yeah. you pitched it or after you've done some of the reporting? In all cases, like if you're writing a pitch, if you wanna pitch something, okay, just throw it on a page, give yourself like an hour and throw it on a page and see what, what's there. 
or if you're writing, if you already have an article that you are, are supposed to write and you want to determine, you know, wh which, where the researching should go or how much you really need to um, throw that on the page as well, uh, because it gives you a starting block. Um, and I think that can be almost like the business plan or what have you in terms of where you need to go. Because if you, if you throw something on the page, you might find, okay, you know, this is a topic that you really know a lot about and that then, you know, the researching is more on the edges, right? Because you know a lot about it already. Whereas you throw everything on a page and you're like, wow, there's a lot of stuff that I don't really know what's going on. And I don't even know where this needs to go. Then that allows you to be more strategic in terms of how you're going to research it and, and how you're going to shore things up. I just think it's difficult if it's, it's, if it's all in your head, because, uh, you know, everyone, everyone, everyone here and everyone out there is creative, right? So you tend to think about that more and more and more and more as it's still in your head. And that that's the problem because then that can just keep continuing, continuing, continuing. But if you have something concrete that you actually have to work on, I think it, it makes a psychological difference. Right. So Stephanie, you get, um, you know, you, you've, um, I'm not sure if you've probably been in the position of sending out pitches for journalistic articles, but I know you've been in the position of having people come to you and say, hey, we need a news release about this, or hey, will you um, write a news release about my, um, my paper that I'm about to publish in this journal? Um, and so tell me, um, for our PIOs and people who might want to move into that direction, um, how do you, how do you approach that? Um, you know, how do you make those decisions and avoid wasting your time? It's a very good question um, because there's a lot of stuff that is going to, is sort of just too insider baseball to be able to make into a story that's going to be um, something that a general audience can relate to, can understand, could care about. I mean, I think, you know, I once heard Gina Collada at the New York Times say that she thinks about her reader as herself. And uh, I sort of feel the same way about my about me. I think of my my the reader as like a smart person who's interested in stuff and wants to be entertained at the same time. And so, if you can, um, if if your research, if I can find a way to get in to it in a way that's going to be uh, at least interesting to a large number of people, maybe if not if not entertaining, um, I think that that's really important. So I think what I, my, my thing is someone sends me something I'm like, oh, that's so boring. So like, I don't want to do it. And I don't think, and it's not just that I don't want to do it. It's that I don't think anyone else wants to read it. So I think that if something, if all of a sudden I'm like, oh, well, what if we talked about this? And the person says, oh yeah, that's really interesting. So I think that that's really important, but I would also say that for the most part, well, unless it's really, really technical and I can't quite figure out what it's about, I usually give the researcher the chance to sell it to me. But I have to tell you, sometimes I can I cannot think of how to get some to get other people interested in this. All right, great. So um, moving forward in the process now, got an audience question on editing. How do you streamline dealing with edits and specifically dealing with edits from the more demanding editors, so strategies beyond working only with editors who are easy to work with. I, th I think it depends on the context. You know, um, I'm sure that my book editor is going to be really involved in. Um, she seems very interested in the nitty gritty of it. So, be given that, I've decided to, um, you know, to sort of try Bruce's method of just sort of putting everything I know out there in a, you know, in a decent form and uh, sort of then my, I'm going to go, then I'll go to her and my co-author and say, okay, so this is how I'm thinking about this. Here's what I've got. You know, what are you thinking? Cause you, cause I just have this feeling that she's going to really uh, be a challenge to work with. Um, I find that for the most part, if you're a freelancer, you kind of have to do the edits that they want. And uh, because if you want to work again in that particular, uh, for that particular person, you need to not be a difficult person. So you need to sort of have an understanding that, um, well, yes, all the words are beautiful, of course, um, they're, they, they might not all make it and they might not all, not all the concepts necessarily will make it. And if they've done something wrong to your story, you made it incorrect, of course, you, you say, no, 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 that's not right. But I find that with... Um, with freelancing that I'm much more amenable to the changes. 
because I have I more power. I, I had to reread that power. question a couple of times because I, in a way the, the, it was kind of like does not compute when I read it because I really do make decisions about who I'll work with based on the edits. I'll work with one editor and if their edits are um, inappropriately onerous, I won't work with that editor again. <laughs> I only work with the editors I can work with. Now, that doesn't mean that I won't work with editors who give me loads of edits back because those can often be phenomenal edits. So it, it really just depends on the quality of the editing. Um, if I can see looking at the edits that, wow, this is going to take me three hours just to even make it through seeing what their edits are, but it's really improving the story and they're making me sound really awesome. And I really like what they're doing with it. Then I want to invest that time in doing that because I can see, wow, they're really helping this. Whereas there are a couple of editors I have decided I will not work with. There's certain publications I will not work with because the editing process was so onerous. And it was one of those processes. In some cases, it was where there was more than one editor and editor one said, add X and you add X and editor two says, why is X here? Remove X. And I'm like, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm not, I don't have time for that. Um, or editors, if I've worked with an editor, there's a big difference between an editor who doesn't understand science and knows they don't understand science and an editor who doesn't understand science and thinks they understand science. I will work with the first one. I will not work with the second one. Um, because if they're trying to tell me that what I wrote was wrong and I know that it's not wrong or they're, or they're asking me questions that are sort of nonsensical, um, I was once um, working on something related to um, infants and sleep, and I mentioned um, something about bottles, and they said, what kind of bottles? And I was like, baby bottles? Like, like if you don't understand that, then why are we working? Like, I, I, I didn't, I, I honestly didn't, I, I thought, I, I was just confused by the question. I was like, do you even know what topic we're talking about? <laughs> they were not a parent, so there's that, but so, um, so I, I, it's like, I don't really need, once I've worked with an editor once, I know their style. And in some cases I've done a really poor job with a story and it needs a lot of effort, you know? Other times I work with an editor and I know what to expect for the next time. So I can sort of um, shape it to what I think they're going to want. But it really does, I think there's sort of a push pull in recognizing that there are great reporters out there and not so great reporters. And there are great editors out there and not so great editors. And I do not have any qualms about not working with the not so great editors. Well, so different people have different preferences in terms of how they want to be edited. Um, do you ever give feedback to your editors and be like, okay, I'm oh, finding yeah. this to be no, really I, onerous? I, I definitely, what I've done before is I'll ask, I'll, I'll get a, um, an edit back. And if it's an edit that kind of bowls me over a bit or overwhelms me, I have a more than one occasion written back and say, thanks for these edits. Um, you've spent a lot of time on this. Do you think we can talk over some of these? I have some questions about some of the things you're asking. And then I, and then I get on the phone with them and I'll say, Hey, you asked this over here. I'm a little confused by that question because X, Y, Z, could you tell me a little bit more about what you're confused about there? So absolutely. Like I, I always give, I mean, editor's job, and, and they usually want to do this, is to make your story better. And, and I love great editors who make my stories better. And sometimes I've had editors where we start off in this kind of rocky start, and I'm kind of like, oh, I don't know about this. And then once I kind of understand their style, if you will, uh, or maybe their way of communicating, I'm like, oh, and then we work great together. Like it was me who didn't understand, right? So I don't mean that in kind of this, oh, well, I know what's best and I'm just going to write you off. Um, I mean, it's definitely a give and take, um, but it's just a matter of finding, and, and some people might be fantastic editors, but their style simply doesn't work well with yours. And so you just reach a point where you're like, hey, I really loved working with you. I'm going to focus on some other stuff, right? You don't need to tell them that their style doesn't fit with you. But if your styles just don't jibe, um, it doesn't mean they're a bad editor. It doesn't mean you're a bad reporter. It just means that your styles don't jibe. I think one of the key things is whenever you get these edits back is to quickly get a sense of the purpose of these edits. Like what is, you know, what's the overall picture? What is the editor trying to do? You know, there could be several things. One is the editor may be completely trying to change the tone of your article. Another might be that they are, you know, there are certain things that they don't, you know, there are certain things they want to move the article in a different direction versus line edits versus, you know, so there's these, so I would say try to get that sense first because then that will save a lot of time because then you're like, okay, I know what this person's after. Um, because many times these actually are connected. Um, or if you if if it's just a matter of line editing, then you know, a lot of those things you can just accept. Now, if you, you're in a situation where you feel that the 
the actual fundamental message of the article is changed um, and you feel that that's not appropriate, that it's, you know, it's different. Like you say, well, the, the, you know, the information here is different or something of that sort. Then you have to decide like what you're willing to yield on and what you want to kind of sit there and say, no, no, this really, this is different information. And if it's different information, naturally you, you might say, well, you know, I don't want to give people the wrong impression and then you can hash it out. So I think really understanding where, where they're, where they're going and what their personality is, is, is important. Mm, great. Um, so we've had a question about tools people use. Um, the question, uh, Tara mentioned that she uses Scrivener. And for someone new to that software, how steep is the learning curve? And are there any other software or um, organizing or writing tools that you'd recommend? Um, I will say with Scrivener, I didn't use it for a whole year after I bought it the first time because I, I am one of those like, you know, wing it people. <laughs> and so I figured I could just wing it, right? You can't wing it with Scrivener. Not, uh, you you need to go through the online tutorial that they have, or well, it's actually not online. It's a built-in tutorial. So after a year, I was kind of like, okay, I'll do the tutorial. And I did the tutorial. It took about an hour and then I was fine. And I didn't remember half of what was in the tutorial, but I didn't need to, because I, I knew what I needed to know. And then anything else I need. So I would say that the learning curve, if you're just kind of trying to wing it is really steep. And you might get frustrated with it. But if you just go through the tutorial and take the time that you need, it might take 30 minutes, it might take two hours, but go through that tutorial. It did a really good job of setting me up for what I needed to know. Um, Scrivener is invaluable to my work. All of the assignments that I do, everything, wh whether it's public speaking, whether it's pitching, whether it's a workshop I'm going to teach, whether it's a webinar I'm preparing for, everything is in one Scrivener file, just one. And that Scrivener file, is broken down like I have my publications and I have subfolders and each of those subfolders has um uh the the individual publications and then within those publications is the story and then within those stories if it's a really extensive story I might have subfolder for interviews I use the um colors to denote them so I can easily find them I, as again with the ADHD colors are really important to me so like National Geographic anything involving Nat Geo in my Gmail and in Scrivener is yellow Anything involving Medscape in my um, Scrivener and in my email is green, like dark forest green. Um, anything involving stat is pale blue, no matter what, in both places, because I can find it fast. And like it, it, you know, I kind of zero in on it quickly. Um, but what I find most useful about Scrivener is that it's all in one place and it automatically backs up. I never have to save. It, it, it auto saves constantly. Um, I can also put a split screen where I have like the interviews on this side and the story on this side, and I just copy and paste and bring it over. And you can do that with Word, but it's just clunkier. Um, so I, I absolutely love Scrivener. It has been invaluable to my work. Um, I also use Otter, and um, it was interesting to hear what um, Stephanie was saying in the beginning, because I have always recorded, but I never used to transcribe them unless I absolutely had to. So I always recorded no matter what, but I took notes and I only relied on my notes. The only time I went back to the recording was if I didn't catch the sentence right or if I want to double check the quote. So I would always do both. Um, and, and before Otter existed, I used Temi, um, which is a different AI transcription service that would help. And I only transcribed the ones that I was actually going to need, but I take advantage of the keyword search in Otter. That helps tremendously. Um, but the other reason that I would always record is because CYA, legal defense, I have been threatened to be sued before. Um, defense against uh, misquoting for editors. If someone says, I didn't say that, I can go to my editor and say, here's the proof. You can hear their actual words saying it. Um, and fact checkers love having audio. They love the transcripts as well. But if you can give a fact checker audio, it's like, the, you know, you, so, so for me, that audio is absolutely essential. Even, but it doesn't mean I have to spend hours transcribing it because I, I agree with Stephanie that, that was a waste of my time, especially when I would make notes as I took it. Right now, at this exact moment in time, I am in week seven or eight of going to PT because I have severe tendonitis and bursitis in both of my arms and have really a lot of trouble working right now. I'm in a lot of pain. Um, some days I have to take multiple painkillers to be able to type at all. Right now, Otter is essential like I can't I literally can't work right now without otter because I can't I can't take notes while I'm doing interviews because any kind of typing is painful so otter is a huge help and then the other um, thing that I use are notes in my iPhone and I use the folders so I have different folders like subfolders I have story ideas folder I have family I have school I have 
you know, to-do lists. I have a whole folder just called to-do lists. <laughs> Um, and then I also use a virtual assistant, which I pay for through Time, et cetera, uh, Time ETC. Um, I've been working with my virtual assistant there now for four and a half or five years, four years, I guess, four years, I think, <laughs> uh, before that I had one that I had for four years. Um, you pay by hourly packages by the month, and that is also invaluable to me. I take the interviewing process for that really seriously. And I, I basically, I need a personal assistant who understands how my weak, weird, wacky brain works and can anticipate what I will forget and anticipate how my brain works. Um, she handles all of my invoicing because it turns out that when you invoice, you actually do get paid. Um, and so I, <laughs> um, when I wasn't getting paid because I wasn't invoicing, lo and behold, when you outsource that, you get paid. Um, so she has been tremendously useful. And I have also, she has learned a lot from me over the years. So I, you know, I've sort of uh, trained her on the fly as we go. There's a little bit of a, 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 you know, time in the beginning to really train her. But over, over the years, she's learned things where I can say, like she helps me out with my social media for an organization that has to do with endocrine disrupting chemicals. And she now looks for all those articles and finds them for me. I don't have to go looking for them. Um, I can tell her, hey, I did a crowdsource on this tweet. Can you go collect all of the um, responses to this tweet and put them in a Google doc for me? Um, anytime I get emailed a you know, when, when um, PR people send me a thing and say, hey, this is a great source. I don't even, I glance at it. I vet it. If it looks good, I hit forward. She adds it to my spreadsheet for me. So Great. that's been hugely helpful. So Bruce, do you, um, uh, do you have any tool? Do you use Scrivener? Do you use Otter? Or do you have any other tools like that that people should know about? Uh, Otter AI, I think, um, you know, just as, as both Tara and uh, Stephanie mentioned, um, but uh, it sounds like Tara is more advanced than me in terms of using these different types of Tool. So I, um, yeah, I still rely on the kind of old standbys like Word and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, so you haven't found the need to to go to to these additional tools. Is um, how how do you how do you use Word? How do you manage without them? Um, well, of course, there's also you know depending on who you're writing for, you you have they have their own platforms as well. Um, so. Uh, yeah, a lot of copying and pasting and a lot of windows open. Um, I, I have a I have a problem with having too many windows open at a given time on my computer. So, um, so yeah, so I suppose I would suppose there. I guess a lot a lot of these things would help with that, right? To organize those different. Uh, to be honest, I have five windows that each have about twelve to fifteen tabs open, so I don't know if it would help with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stephanie and Tara, you both mentioned how you, you don't want to waste a lot of time transcribing your interview recordings. You know, you want to try and get the notes during the interview. Um, do you have any tips? Uh, there's a question from the audience here, and I've been wondering this too. Do you have any tips on how to take notes during interviews and have them be exactly what you need? Uh, I'll jump in there real quick on that one. Um, I listen for what the quotes are. If they're explaining something in detail, I may not need to write down every word, but I also make notes to myself about what that quote is. So like if I can't get the full quote, but I know that it's a really good quote explaining the such and such concept, I'll start to write it and I'll put dash, get this dash, a slug for the concept. And then I'll continue, which is why I have the recording because those little notes to myself are more important than getting the entire quote perfectly the first time if I have the recording. And then I can go back and find it if I didn't get the full quote. Um, I will also, if I hear the kicker, I, I will always listen for the kicker when I'm listening, you know, and I will say possible kicker as I'm doing the thing. I use bolding and I also use underlining. So I, um, and I, I skip lines if we break in concepts. So it's, it's sort of a, just a sort of a shorthand of sorts that I've developed over the years. Oops, Stephanie, you're on mute. I'm really old fashioned. I use pen and paper and I, and I star things that, that I know are good concepts slash quotes. And I um, stop people while they're talking sometimes to get down something that's really good. Uh, I just, um, I've never been able to, my brain doesn't allow me to sort of go past a typo on a screen. So I can't type notes as I'm working because I'll, I'll be six steps back. The whole time. Stephanie, you, you have like a, 
a really quick shorthand because I remember one time I was talking to you about um, a press release or something like that, and you were writing things down. And I was, I, it was, I was struck by how quickly you were getting everything down. Yeah. And it looked like you had like some kind of shorthand where you were really able to get things down. Well, I've been doing this for a long time. Like, so I've been doing, <laughs> I've been doing this for 30 years, basically. Um, and so I've got, I do have a little bit of a shorthand. I'm very quick. I can write very quickly. Um, I will say though, it's interesting that I have to use that muscle periodically to sort of, to keep it in shape because for example, I don't, um, in my, in my work at, uh, in my day in my day job, I don't actually have to get the quote down perfectly, right? I can I can embellish it, and then the person approves it because if I'm writing a press release, so I have to get it close, or it, or I didn't even have to get it close as long as they approve what I'm writing. But I've been doing more uh, freelance work, and I'm doing this book, and it's just interesting because you have to really um, you really have to be careful, make sure you get the, all the things you need. And so it's it's a little difficult going back and forth with the brain. It took me forever to learn how to make up a quote, like forever. I'm still not very good at it um, because I'm so trained as a journalist that being a PR person, when you can just sort of say what you want to say um, and have the person sign off on it is is like a, still a foreign concept to me. All right. Um, we have, uh, we're, we're running out of time here. So I want to ask all of you if there are important tips or strategies for speeding things up that we haven't covered that you want to make sure we all understand. Um, I'll add that I do a lot of outlining throughout my stories. That helps me a lot. I, and, and some people like, like, um, uh, Stephanie was saying are just not outline people. So if outlining doesn't work for you, don't do it. But if it does, I mean, use it to its greatest advantage. Um, one, uh, this is a more complex process that I could discuss some other time. But when I'm doing really involved stories that are really long, like big features, and there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of different um, uh, speakers, you know, sources, I will use, I have sort of a highlighting system where pink is, I definitely want to use this quote, um, yellow is this could be interesting green is this is background information like it's a set and then I will literally get out a pair of scissors I will print it so I print it out I physically highlight get out a pair of scissors and I will physically move them around like puzzle pieces and if I'm still really struggling I'll write out an outline of what I think it needs to be or if I don't even have a clue of that I'll write out like here are the 10 things I need to cover in this story. And I have no idea what to cover them, what order to cover them in. I will write them all down in big print and then cut them out and literally move them around. And I have been known to move them around, take a picture and send a friend and say, does this make sense? Or to call my husband in and say, does this work or should I move this and this? And um, it, so to help me get a guide. And then once I do that, I'll move each of them up and I'll take those cut out quotes and I'll stick them in where they need to go. It's literally like making a puzzle piece. That's only for my super big pieces, but like for the really complex ones, but it helps a lot to have that tactile and color involvement. That is, I'm definitely going to have to try that. Um, Bruce, <laughs> any, uh, any last things that we haven't covered that you want to share? Well, I think one of the things to remember is every single article you write or everything, you literally could write an entire book on it. Like, you know, so there has to be some kind of end uh, because, you know, you could write volumes about something. So you have to decide fairly quickly, like, you know, how are you going to encapsulate this? And maybe if it's getting too big, maybe you would just want to divide it up into multiple articles that you don't really like the purpose of an article or, or pitch or what have you is not to say everything there is about the topic, but where is, you know, wh what are the boundaries? And there's only, you know, there's only so many points that you necessarily, need. you know, they always talk about three to four, like three to four major points that you want to make in something. And it's better to make like several strong points rather than like 10, 15, you know, weaker points. Um, and then also, I think it's important to have some, you know, give yourself, so naturally some things there will be a natural deadline, but other articles like evergreen pieces or longer research pieces, there's, can, there may not be a real deadline, but you have to give yourself a deadline because what happens is you, ju you, you just put it down and you never pick it back up. So you have to just say that, okay, I'm going to just concentrate and get this done in, in, in X amount of time and then just see what you can do in that time. So I think those are, those are key. 
Great. Stephanie, why don't you wrap it up for us? I, I just think, and I don't know if this is helpful, but I think that the more you do it, the more you get a feel for it. And the more you get a feel for this is wasting my time. This is going down a rabbit hole. This is exactly what I need to be doing. And I think that you, I don't know, my gut sort of tells me how long I should spend on a story. Um, you know, I, 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 I tend to get my work done as soon as I possibly can, as soon as I have assigned it. And I try to, I try to get it out of the way. And so it's just always, because I've always in my brain, I'm working on deadline for today's paper. Um, or I guess even for the blog I could post in five minutes. So that's how, uh, so I think the longer you do it, the more you get a real feel for what is wasted time and what is time well spent. And there's certainly going to be things that might to, to you might seem like wasted time, but someone else is going to be time well spent. And so you just have to really understand yourself and, you know, what you get out of it. That is absolutely the message I'm getting because you all have such different strategies and approaches that have worked so well for you. So um, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you here. Um, and that is all our time. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. you. Thanks, Bella.